Over four years ago, I went to work at a warehouse in a small town as a quality control technician. I decided to leave after my health started to get worse physically, and I was diagnosed with panic disorder and severe anxiety after the situation that I'm about to tell you. This changed the way that I developed friendships after that job, that's for certain. So, I started this job on April Fool's Day of 2019, and I had no kind of high expectation of the job. All I wanted was to do my job, get paid, and go home, as I had two children at home and many things that I could work on there. The job wasn't hard, and it made pretty good money for all duties considered, so I really couldn't complain. I worked second shift for about five months, and I went to day shift. While working on second shift, I kept to myself mostly until, one day, I met someone from one of the lines after we struck up a conversation about gaming. He introduced himself as Jay. Well, Jay was a pretty good guy and we had a lot of things in common. I went home that night and he popped up as a suggested friend on Facebook, so I decided to add him. When I did, we started talking more at work, until he suggested we should hang out. So, we did hang out, pretty frequently. We were friends for a month at this point, and one day, he decided that he was going to introduce me to his partner. She seemed decent at first, really nice, didn't seem to be a judgmental type, so I was cool with her. From then on, I would hang out with him when my kids were spending time with my mother. One time, we were talking at a restaurant, and he started to vent to me. Dude, she's such a bitch sometimes. The other day, I forgot to take out the trash, and she threatened to stab me if I didn't. I've never been in a relationship where someone's threatened me, but she's got good intentions, dude. When he said that to me, I was concerned. But of course, we'd only been friends for a month, so I thought that maybe he was being morbid jokingly, so I chuckled at him. He gave me a pretty serious look and said, I'm not joking, she really did. That concerned me. Fast forward about eight months, they're still together and we all hang out pretty regularly, forgetting the things he told me then. One day we were all talking and he seemed a little off that day, so I asked him what was wrong in front of her. He flashed a smirk and said, Nothing dude, I'm just a little tired. He didn't have his eyes on me though, he had them on her when I asked that. When we went to work the next day, I asked him again, Do you promise to keep this between us? Of course, I agreed. He said that he was breaking up with her and she went a little crazy. He said that he grabbed her firearm and pointed it at him and said, If I can't have you, then no one will. He said that he defused the situation and he's trying to look for a way out. Not really knowing what to say, I just said, You'll figure it out, man. If you need somewhere to go, then you can come stay with me until you get her out of the house. Fast forward to another year. He finally decided to leave her. When he did, she flipped out again. This time, he told her over text. She said that she was going to find him and kill him, and he was actually out of work that day with a vacation day. He sent me a text that said, Hey, let me know if she comes over to work looking for me. That struck me as odd because I had no idea of the situation that was unfolding. She actually did come to our job and she asked me where he was and I said, I have no idea. I thought he was with you and you guys went out of town or something. All she did was roll up her window and drive off. I called him and told him that she came by and he called the police about it. They had found her up the road with a loaded gun in the car. Two months later, he decided to talk to her again, and when he did, he had something to tell me. When he called me, he asked if I had seen her around, and I hadn't. He said, I would take some vacation days if I were you. Dumbfounded, I asked him why. He said to me, because she's out of jail and her cousins are in town trying to find the people she has personal vendettas with. You are one of them. At that point, I was terrified. I grabbed my kids and went out of town, and I took two weeks off of work. Come to find out that the next day, 
Her and her cousins went to the next town over and shot three people in an apartment and killed them. I got the news about it the day after it happened. The reason why he knew they were coming after me is because they made a Facebook messenger group that he was included in and sent a list of names. Everyone regarded it as spam and decided to disregard the message, but he knew what it was. Three of those names on that list were the people they shot. The fourth name on that list was mine. After they found the evidence and he decided to go public about the group and screenshots that he had, they were all charged with first degree murder. From then on, I was very careful about who I would stick my neck out for, because even though he knew the context of that list and her intentions, he decided to not inform anyone else on it. Needless to say, we aren't friends anymore, and I dodged a bullet, literally. In 2017, I heard news of people dressing up as clowns and running around with knives at night. I typically brush those things off because I've got my own problems. I was often up all hours of the night dealing with my screaming newborn. It was January or February, so we still had some snow and I wasn't able to get out of the house often. Taking out the trash, which is located right out the back door, was usually the most I got of fresh air. One morning, I took out the trash and happened to glance over to the right and noticed footprints directly under the window to my newborn baby's room. I walked over to inspect, and not only were there footprints, but there were also hand indentations on the window screen. Weird, but my baby slept in my room, so I'm not very concerned at the moment. But my boyfriend was losing his marbles. Fast forward a couple of days, and I was up at around 3 a.m., and I heard what I would not exactly call screaming, but more of a screeching howl. We have a lot of stray cats, so I kind of thought that's what it was and ignored it. Once the sun was up, I looked out the window and noticed a few set of footprints that really didn't make sense, because it kind of looked like someone had just been passing in between the house. But again, I blow it off because we had a drug house across the street and we have had people crossing through our yard before they get to that house. Maybe four nights later, again at 3am, I'm breastfeeding and hear a dragging noise against the house, and from where I was sitting on the couch, I could see the back door. The back door has a window with blinds on it, and doesn't seal well due to wood rot on the frame. I paused the TV and listened just to hear it again, now directly at the back door. Looking over, I can clearly see a looming figure just standing in the window. I could see the outline of one of those big kitchen knives, and granted the blinds were shut, so I am seeing the creepy shadow version of this. He runs the knife across the window pane before softly knocking. Meanwhile, I'm trying to figure out what to do with a newborn latched on, because my phone is in the bedroom and something in me doesn't want whoever this is out of my vision. So I stand up and readjust, because I really don't want a screaming baby right then. I walk into my kitchen and flick on the light, and then said, just loud enough for him to hear me, Hey man, I already called the police, and I'm sure you don't want to deal with them, so why don't you go home? I don't know why I talked to him so calmly and normal, but I don't think he was expecting anyone to say anything, because he froze the moment I began talking. He talked it over with himself for a minute and darted toward the alleyway. I've never had anything like that happen since, but my boyfriend sure was mad I didn't wake him up to handle the situation, or at least call the police. I'm not sure if this counts as a creepy encounter, but I was sure creeped out once my sleep-deprived self realized what happened. When I was seven years old, my mother and father got a divorce. This event prompted her to move and follow her career in a different small town, which would pay better, as she was a single parent now. On our long 12-hour drive to the new location, 
We stopped on the way in this little town which was very hippie. Sort of had lots of art, little shops and whatnot. My mom said we were there to meet up with her friend, Paulette. I guess they went way back in her college days and recently got in touch after a decade. We end up going to this East Indian restaurant where we would meet for dinner. This slender, somewhat fragile woman walks in. She was very tall, well over six feet. Big, frizzy, curly brown hair with blonde streaks in it. She was Caucasian, wearing a colorful shawl with feather earrings, with very pale blue eyes. She looked like a mosaic tapestry or something. She walks over to the table and gives my mom a greeting and a big hug, makes her way over to my older brother and shakes his hand. After, she comes around to my side of the table. I lend my hand out to her, and she just stood there expressionless, with her mouth partly open with a blank gaze, just staring at me. It briefly made me uncomfortable, and then like a flick of a switch, this spark ignites in her face. She makes this huge Cheshire cat smile, kneels over and hugs me tightly. She goes back to sit with my mom and they catch up over the years while we eat dinner. My mom gets the bill and says to her in the parking lot, You can just follow us, to Paulette. We get in the car and my mom explains to us, Paulette is actually coming over to live with us for a while. She followed us for the next several hours. We get to the new place and unpack our necessity items, as we had a moving truck hired with the rest of our stuff arriving in the morning. There was a bunk bed already set up at this place for me and my brother. It was fairly late into the night, roughly 11pm when we arrived. Me and my brother set up our sleeping bags. I take the top bunk. My mom says goodnight. I fell asleep pretty quickly. I wake up at around 1.30am. I guess the patio deck light got turned on, which was right beside our room. I gazed out through the blinders, and I see the back of Paulette's curly hair. She was sitting on the deck, cross-legged, smoking a cigarette. I didn't think much of it, and I lay back down, until I noticed the light from the window gets partly blocked out. I look behind me with my head still on the pillow. I see the unmistakable outline of Paulette's shadow facing my window. She was there for a few minutes. I didn't want to lean up, I just pretended to sleep. Her shadow moves and I hear the front door close. The patio light turns off after a few seconds. I reposition myself facing the wall to go back to sleep. As I begin to drift off, the door to our room opens slowly and I quickly turned my head around. It wasn't my mom, it's Paulette wearing a nightgown. I turn back facing the wall and close my eyes. She quietly makes her way to my bunk. I feel her fingers in a claw formation start to comb the back of my hair, running her nails onto the back of my scalp. I kept my eyes closed tightly, nearly holding my breath, trying to give no signs I'm awake. I smell some essential oils like lavender, and she starts rubbing oil into the back of my neck and pinching the back of my neck muscle, sometimes holding it and releasing it. I begin to kind of just accept whatever is happening, because it didn't feel all that bad after a while. I actually ended up falling asleep to it after my initial confusion. I wake up in the morning, my mom is off at work, and Paulette is waiting at the table with cereal for me and my brother. She put some chocolate chips in my bowl and not my brother's. My brother and I make small talk with her. She was very giggly, seemed to be trying to make us comfortable with the new situation. My brother heads back to his room to set up his GameCube after his cereal. I was a slower eater than my older brother, so I was always the last at the table. As I slowly ate, she was sitting there watching my every move. Once I finished, I said thank you and grabbed my bowl to bring it to the sink. She places her hand on mine and says, I gave you a neck massage so you wouldn't pee your bed. I know lots of young ones pee beds when they sleep in unfamiliar surroundings. I looked up at her and said, I've never peed my bed before, but thank you. She continued to massage the back of my neck for the next few nights. I ended up telling her I'm comfortable here now and I don't need her to do that anymore. 
She reacted to that with a sigh, but acknowledged it. I started elementary school the following week, which meant getting earlier night's sleep at around 8pm. Her and my mom would stay up much later than me and my brother and drink wine. I always waited for them to go to bed before I used the washroom at night to go pee, because my mom would kind of scold me for being up late on weeknights. Once things got quiet at around 11 in the house, I'd sneak out and tiptoe to go use the washroom. This was my ritual for the next few weeks, until Paulette started doing the exact same thing at the same time. Every time. Every night when I needed the washroom, it just so happened Paulette needed it too, and she would blaze down the hallway across from my room when I'd open the door. I'd just go back in my room and wait for her. It started happening so frequently I would just go outside to pee from the back mudroom door. This started to piss me off, no pun intended. I'd open my door as quietly as I could and then sprint to the washroom. This seemed effective for a while. One night, I'd get up slightly later than usual at around 12. I was a little more careless with noise because I was half asleep and groggy. I open the door and Paulette's door just slams open instantly. She barges out into the dimly moonlit hallway completely naked and just start quickly walking down the hallway. I was already so far down the hallway, I couldn't turn back to my room. I jump behind my mom's jade plant and squish my knees to my chest and tuck my head down. She whizzes straight by me so fast, I felt wind push my hair. She stays in the washroom for almost an hour with the door open to crack, lights off in silence. I stayed there beside the washroom, tucked in the corner behind the plant pot, not making a sound. I hear the washroom door open completely, and she starts pacing up and down the hallway. I kept small and insignificant behind the plant until she goes back to her room. I brushed this off as a complete accident. It was just unfortunate timing. But no, every night going forward, she would literally sprint down the hallway naked if I'd make a single noise, creak the floorboard, open my door or whatever. About two months into this, me and my brother were sword fighting with tree branches outside. He ends up clipping my forehead, causing it to bleed pretty bad. Paulette sees this happen. She walks up to my brother, what I thought would be to scold him, but no. She stomp kicks him in the head with her boot, causing him to fall on his back. He gets up off the ground crying and runs into the house. She grabs me and starts cradling me, rocking back and forth. She's shaking so much that she was vibrating. She kept repeatedly asking me, are you hurt? In a shaky voice. Anyway, my mom finds out through my brother what happened and decides she had to leave. Her final day, she made a point to see me one-on-one -on -one in the driveway before entering her car. She knelt down and said, I hope I see you in a different life. You remind me so much of my husband. Goodbye. And she starts bawling her eyes out, hugging me. I asked my mom who her husband was. I guess he was a marine that died in Afghanistan a few months prior to her moving in with us. My mom said she would frequently say how much I reminded her of him on a daily basis. My mom hasn't spoken to her since. I've never told my mom about the massages or anything to this day, as she was already exiled and I felt it would just cause more drama. Hello everyone, something really creepy happened to me yesterday. I'm still processing it because what the fuck? For a bit of context, I live in Ireland, a pretty peaceful country. I recently moved from Galway to Dublin. I moved up north to Dublin which is a rougher part but it's still not too bad. I live with my family outside the city. The area is pretty rural. It's just houses and farms pretty much, with no shops or stations nearby. There are no sidewalks, and the road is pretty narrow and worn out. It's rare to see cars, so it's fine to just go on the road. I was going on my daily 2k run. Usually I go around at 6pm, 
but yesterday I had some studying to do and went out at around 9pm. Let me describe the experience. Imagine to your left there's a house that's lived in with its lights on. Then on your right you see a field slash farm. Then you'll see an abandoned building right beside. And then there's an area of trees for 200 meters or so. This is pretty much the whole road. Not abandoned, but creepy enough to scare me at night. Anyways, I usually listen to music on my run with the volume all the way up so I can't hear anything. So I reach the area with a patch of trees. It's basically pitch black, the lights don't work properly, so I need to use a flashlight to navigate. The street lights are flickering on and off, but they eventually stay on, so that's great. But that's when it hits me. There's a figure standing around 30 meters away, about 20 meters from the road in the trees. First, I thought I was seeing stuff, but no. This person was standing still, not moving at all. I'm creeped out, so I keep running. I turn down the volume of the music just in case to hear the figure move so I can make a run for it. I speed up and pass the figure. I still don't turn up my music. After I'm around 100 meters away, I turn up the music and try to process what happened. Maybe I was seeing things because it was pretty dark. At this point, I'm long gone. However, I still have to come back home, and I usually walk back the distance I ran, so it's basically I run 2k and walk back 2k. Again, I come to that spot. This time, the lights are flickering, but they're mostly staying on. I try to observe the spot where the figure was standing, but I see nothing. I'm creeped out at this point. I turn off the music and start to run past that spot because I'm scared. And then suddenly a man jumps across the street in front of me. It looks like the same figure. I come to a halt for a second. I'm shocked. He then starts moving, so I turn around and start running as fast as I can. While I'm doing this, I start screaming for help. I eventually passed the tree area and went to an area with houses. Someone heard me screaming and came out asking me if everything was okay. I stop running and realize the guy is gone. I explain everything to the man. I'm really creeped out and scared. I still need to go back home, but my parents aren't there. They went over to their friend's house, so I'm left home alone. I ask the stranger for a lift, because I'm not going back there ever again. Thankfully, the stranger isn't a big old creep and he kindly escorts me home. I lock all the doors and check everything to make sure I'm safe. Shortly after, my parents arrive, but I don't tell them anything because I don't want to worry them. I haven't gone out for a run today because I'm genuinely scared. I'm terrified thinking about what would have happened if I was too tired to run and he caught me. I don't think anything else will happen though, hopefully. This happened about 30 years ago in a small town about 10 minutes outside of Atlantic City. I was about 25 at the time, and my mom was in her mid-50s. It was a week or so before Christmas, and my mom asked if I wanted to go with her to a small shop so she could pick up a few things. I agreed, and even offered to drive. We pulled into the parking lot and parked facing a stockade fence, the kind that were all in the range of 80s to 90s. This lot was bordered by the small, barely two-lane street on the side we entered on, and a four-lane highway on the other side. The lot served as a Chinese restaurant, a deli, a pizzeria, the shop we were stopping in, and a few other businesses. It was around 6pm, so only the pizzeria, the restaurant, and the shop were open, so there were very few cars. The first three spots on either end were handicapped spaces, so I parked further down in one of about eight spots between the handicap spots. We get out of the car and had only gone a few steps toward the street when a man I would guess was in his late 30s to early 40s walked out from between a couple of cars. My spider sense went into full alert immediately. He took a couple steps towards us, looked right at us and said, I fucking hate people like you, in a low menacing voice. 
I instinctively took a step to my side to place myself between him and my mom. Like what? I said. People that park in handicapped spots, he said, nodding behind me. I'd grown up in this town. I rode my bike here all the time as a kid and was here quite often as an adult. I knew for sure that I wasn't in one of those spots. I had even parked a few spaces further in since neither me or my mom had mobility issues. I'm not in a handicapped spot, I said confidently. This time the man pointed over my shoulder, grew agitated and said, Yes you are. Look. It was then that I realized that he knew we weren't parked in a handicapped spot, but he was trying to get me to turn around. I don't know what his intentions were. I'm a pretty big guy at 6 foot 1 and 200 plus pounds. I'm not sure if he had a weapon or just wanted to distract me so he could get the jump, maybe snatch my mom's purse. Either way, I decided that rather than confront him directly, I would play a little game back. I drove a Chrysler, and back then, the keys were topped with a black plastic pentagon with a Dodge logo stamped into it. I curled my fist around the plastic head of the key, with the metal parts sticking out a couple of inches between my pointer and middle fingers, so that if I were to be punched in the eye, well, they wouldn't have an eye after that. I held my hand up and pointed over my shoulder with the metal part of the key and said, There's no sign on that spot. His eyes flashed from behind me to the key protruding from between my fingers, back to my eyes. I flashed my eyes to the key, lowered my hand slightly, then met his gaze. My mom is behind me, saying something I don't recall. This game of chicken between me and this guy goes on for about three to four seconds, before he says, whatever, fuck you, and walks away towards the highway at the opposite end of the parking lot. I watch him leave before turning around. Sure enough, there were at least three spots between my car and any handicapped spot. He was 100% trying to distract me. He was so matter-of-fact that as we walked towards the store, my mom was wondering what he was going on about. I told her that he was trying to get me or us to turn around. The second time, when he had pointed, my mom said she turned around, even though she knew we weren't parked in a handicapped spot. I'm glad I trusted my instincts. It's not the first time my spider sense was right, but that's a story for another day. This happened to me about five to six years ago. I went out for dinner with a friend. I'd left my car at a condo since we carpooled. When we returned to the condo, we parted ways. She went into her unit by elevator, and I walked to my car parked outside. It was around 11pm and there were lots of lights around, but I still took precaution considering that this wasn't the best part of town. No one else was outside, no cars leaving or coming in. I got into my car and proceeded to drive on my merry way home as normal. I pulled up to a red light and a white SUV pulled up beside me. I absentmindedly looked around and then looked to my right and made eye contact with the driver. I'm not sure how long he was staring for, but it was creepy. I suddenly got a cold sweat feeling. I proceeded to drive down the long street and his car was always beside mine. I noticed he was watching my speed and trying to look over at me. I ignored it. This went on for 15 minutes down the same street. My house was another 15 minutes away. There were other cars, but they mostly turned into the smaller streets. I was nervous the whole time, so I texted my friend and my boyfriend to let them know what was happening, but that I was fine for now, and maybe I was misinterpreting this. At one point, the street became one lane because the cars parked on the right side overnight so the SUV ended up behind me the whole way. I finally made a turn to another main street where there was more traffic. Somehow he kept up and was pretty much tailing me. I called my boyfriend freaking out and almost crying at this point. 
He told me to stay calm and to try and turn around onto another major street, not to a small one in case anything happened. We hit an area with construction workers working on the road, so two lanes were closing. I was in the far left lane. He pulled up to the pylons to my right and rolled down his window. I'm pretty sure he was shouting to me at this point. His lips were moving, but I don't know what he said. He pointed at me to roll down my window. He looked angry and a little deranged. I sped off as soon as the light changed, but he was stuck in that lane because no one was letting him through. I was able to get home safely and my boyfriend met up with me in the garage. I was shaken, but thankfully it never happened again. When I told this story to my friends, there was a question of, what if there was something wrong with your car and he just wanted to tell you? But no, there wasn't. There was no flat tire or open door. The gas cap was intact. To this day, I have no idea what he wanted. And I don't think I want to know. Coming back from Kununurra, a very northern town in Western Australia, to Perth one night, there was no one else on the road for hours, but every now and then, on a long straight, I could see a set of taillights in the distance. All of a sudden, there's the taillights, attached to a trailer that stopped dead in the middle of the road. I slammed on the brakes and swerved around it, and that's when I realized that the truck, towing three cars, had run off the road into the only large tree for miles. If not for how this ended, I'd laugh my ass off at the irony. I pulled forward off the road and jumped out. My co-driver, who'd been asleep but got thrown out of the bunk when I slammed on the brakes, was already calling emergency services. As I got to the back of my third trailer, wisps of smoke started from under the cab of the Volvo wrapped around the tree. I raced back grabbed a fire extinguisher, and was running towards the wreck when I heard a groan from the ditch, about ten meters in front of the wreck. The driver had been thrown clean through the windscreen, and while he was an absolute mess, at least he was alive. The Volvo was, by now, in flames, but that just gave me some light to inspect the guy for injuries, and then I heard the sound that even now tears me to the core. A thin, high-pitched squeal, gradually progressing into the most soul-piercing scream I've ever heard. His co-driver had also been asleep in the bunk, and with the truck wrapped around the tree, he was stuck, and I hadn't thought to fight the fire. And now some poor bastard was burning to death, trapped in a steel coffin while I just collapsed, impotent and broken. I still drive trucks now, it's my life. It's cost me several relationships and a marriage, but I don't know anything else that I can do. I love the life, I love the freedom, and I always know that I can lose everything in the blink of an eye. But I never again, and never will, drive as a two-up team. I could never live with killing a workmate because I fucked up. For the weekend, I wanted to visit my boyfriend. He lives two hours away and I go by train. I'm not easily spooked, but I always keep an eye out. One hour into the trip, it was around 8 in the evening then, I see two men getting into the same train compartment as me. I was sitting in a two-seat, the seat next to me was empty, and in front of me there was a seat for four people, so two pairs of seats facing each other. The men came in being very loud, but nobody said anything because they already seemed very suspicious. From the moment they stepped into the train, probably before they got in, they had their eyes fixated on me. They stepped in through the doors and sat in the seat in front of mine, and from then on they kept an eye on me, while discussing things with each other in a language I didn't understand. 
Like every other girl, I get stared at frequently, especially when I wear my hair down. It normally makes me feel a bit awkward, but I never feel unsafe when this happens. Until yesterday. But they were staring at me in every possible way. Through the chairs, standing up, sitting down, and bending over to get a good look. Through the reflection of the mirror, and by getting up and walking past me, they were taking turns in walking over to the other compartment of the train. The other compartment was only separated from mine with a glass door. Every time one of them got up, they both started staring at me. Then one of them went away, and the other one had a clear vision of me and kept staring at me. He poked his head through the middle of the seats and offered me a chocolate, which I politely refused. Then the other one came back and five minutes later, the man who did not go away yet went away in the same direction. They kept taking turns and walking away, and every time one of them got up, the other who remained seated kept an eye on the other, and on me. Each time they were sitting across from each other, they discussed things, but I could not translate it. They kept looking at me, and then started discussing again. When I had 20 minutes of my trip left, a lot of people got out at one stop. It was just me, them, and one other male left. The moment the doors were about to close, one of the creepy men started walking through the doors to check if there were people coming in, and maybe to check if there was security. I don't know why he did it, but when he came back, he scanned the train to see how many people were still on there. From that moment on, they both got in seats facing me. They would not stop staring at this point. As you can imagine, I panicked and was stressed the fuck out. So, I slowly turned around to look behind the glass doors to see if there were any more people there. I slowly and very softly put on my jacket, and I kid you not, not even two minutes later, one of the men starts getting dressed too. He took his bag and his jacket and kept looking at me. He was fixated on me while still discussing with the other man. This was where I really panicked. I already let my friends know what was going on, and my boyfriend was already at the train stop where I was supposed to get out. Then I contemplated what the smartest thing to do was, because there is an emergency number on the train that you can call or text if you feel unsafe. But I had a gut feeling that this wouldn't help me. So I got my bags got up, and walked through the glass doors to the other compartment. I sat facing them so I could see what they were doing. They both got up, grabbed their bags, and started walking towards me. Mind you, they were sitting closest to the exit, so there was absolutely no reason for them to take this route too. I rapidly started to talk to someone on the seats next from mine and asked if he could help me because I was getting followed and watched by two grown men. He said he also thought they were very suspicious and was getting scared for me. He asked me to sit next to him so he could help keep me a little safer and distract the men or something. Then he distracted me a bit and asked questions about my life. When the two creeps saw I got seated next to a man, they were already coming my way and were making their way through the doors of the compartment. Their glass doors so we could see each other very clearly. I'd not shown my fear, but I was shaking so uncomfortably that they must have seen how scared I was. The moment they got through that door, they saw me getting seated next to the man, and the creeps exchanged looks, looked at me, discussed something, looked at me again, turned around and went the other way again. They were walking to the exit of the train, where, again, there is a glass door, so we could still see each other. The whole time they were standing around the exit, they were looking at me with a very creepy and disturbed look on their faces. I describe it as, you got away, but you won't be lucky next time. That's how I felt. The man I was sitting next to also got the hang of this and was calming me down. He told me he was not going to let me get off the train by myself and would wait with me until my boyfriend would arrive. But then came our stop, 
and we walked to our side of the exit. And then came a realization. In the exit of the train, there were two other men standing there with the same kind of look as the two creeps. They talked the same language and they acted weird too. These men were probably the men the two creeps visited every few minutes. The man at the exit saw me, looked at me with a creepy look, but then the man who kept me safe made sure to let them know that he was walking with me, and they immediately looked away. They also covered their faces with hoods. The doors opened and they nearly sprinted out of there, just as the other two creeps did. The man who escorted me out waited with me until we found my boyfriend, and then he went on with his day. We both could not thank him enough for keeping me safe. I thought I lived in a very safe country in Europe, but I think that as long as you're a young woman or on your own, you will never be 100% safe while traveling or being alone. I hate thinking about what would have happened if I was not helped out by that man. I wish I could have thanked him with gifts or a nice gesture, but I never got his name and will probably never see him again. To the man who saved me, I thank you with all my heart. I hope people hearing this, as well as myself, stay safe. Just be on the lookout for each other and help someone when you can. Thanks for listening. This story takes place last summer in August, when I went to visit my friend in another city. I'd been there for one day and this night we decided to go out for some drinks and then for dinner. While we were walking to the restaurant, dressed to the nines, a couple of men older than us stopped us and asked what we were doing that night. We chatted and then asked if we would be willing to come for a drink with them after. My friend and I, being young, and liking the attention of course, said we would see how we feel, and they said that they would be staying at the restaurant that we saw them outside of, and that their usual table was right next to the patio entrance. We went for our dinner and as we were walking back, not thinking of these men that we'd previously encountered, we heard them calling over, and they said, just join us for a drink. My friend and I kind of looked at each other, and it was only about midnight, so we decided that we would go and join them for a drink. My friend is hilarious, and we're both really assertive, so she decided to ask for two triples and a shot of expensive tequila when they asked us what we wanted to drink. They laughed and said how they liked that she knew what she wanted. The drinks came out pretty quickly, but the shots were taking a while, and one of the gentlemen had gotten up and left the table we assumed to take a call. After a few minutes, the gentleman came back to the table and sat down next to my friend, and the shots came out not long after with the waitress. Not thinking anything of this, my friend and I took her shots, and almost five minutes later, my friend looked at me and said, something's wrong, I don't feel right. My friend in general tends to overreact in some situations, so I brush it off and say, don't worry, everything's okay. The next part of the story is not coming from my own recollection, it's coming from my friend's recollection, because unfortunately I don't remember anything from that night. My friend said that I began slurring my words and acting a lot more drunk than I should have been, given the amount that I had drank, and one of the gentlemen suggested that they give us a ride home because I wasn't looking so well, and I'd probably drank too much. My friend asked if they'd had a car, because in this big city, it's not common to drive around. It's more common to taxi or Uber, and they'd pointed to a Rolls Royce that had illegally tinted windows, and was running with a driver in the front, about five feet away from the patio that we were sitting on. And it had been there for about 30 minutes. My friend immediately got a weird feeling, and though she was also feeling kind of loopy and dizzy, she got us both out of there. She said she provided no explanation, and she grabbed me by the arm and started dragging me down the street in a downtown, highly populated area 
while booking an Uber. According to my friend, the entirety of the Uber ride I was sweating profusely, vomiting, I could barely walk, and I couldn't speak. My eyes were rolled back, and I was completely incoherent. When asking my friend about how I got so sick, and how she didn't, she reminded me that she'd been drinking a lot the night before, and wasn't feeling that great, so she only took about a third of the shot because she wasn't able to finish the whole thing because she thought she was going to vomit. Me, on the other hand, of course. I took the entirety of the shot down and clearly got a higher dose of whatever was given. The next day, obviously, I felt like absolute garbage, but needless to say, I think my friend definitely saved us both that night, if not just me, from an unknown group of men who had unknown intentions with two young drunk girls and then drugged them in the heart of a big city. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdoski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel De Luna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Kuro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B., Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C., Wasps Sting, Jennifer J., Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, Pie Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanitix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracoat, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. 
I hope you're doing well guys. I'll see you all on the next one.